remember his name, because I can't even pronounce it. I think he's Polish over here in Australia somewhere. But he has no arms and legs. And he goes around ministering. And he crawls. And he, and he does rap with his, he calls his little duck foot. Because he got a little tail that he beats his little drum beat with. And he's just rejoicing. And he lives on his own. Can you imagine somebody driving a car with no arms and no legs? Yeah. Cook their own meals. And they were showing how he did. He used every other part of his body to clean himself, cook, drive, and everything. And here we are with legs and arms. And I was like, boy, do I got a reason to rejoice. But he believed that God made him that way for his glory. Aren't you made for his glory too? Amen. Then rejoice so. I don't care if somebody call you ugly, call you this and that, you ain't my type, you too big, you too skinny. Next to that, I'm God's creation, and I'm going to rejoice in it. Amen? Amen. 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 Joy is the fruit of a right relationship with the God. Joy is a fruit of right relationship with God. It is not something people can create by their own efforts. Can you create joy by your own efforts? Because I'm going to show you what happens in the Bible if you try to create joy by your own efforts. Because we've been living in a false joy. Ready? Even in laughter, the heart is sorrow. You know how you just put on airs, you don't want nobody to know your business. And so you smile and you laugh with them and actually deep down inside, you heard me? But you may have riches, you may have things, but there ain't no happiness or joy in you at all. You thought all those things were going to make you happy. Matter of fact, I didn't really get no joy until I lost everything. And I was one of those kinds of people that said, boy, I would never go home because I'd kill myself before I go home. You know, I had two homes, you know, one in Philadelphia, one in Atlantic City, wonderful marriage, brand new car, every kind of suit I can name, kinds of jewelry I can have that I've on and pawned and smoked it up anyway. Amen. Amen. <laughs> you know? But when I lost it all, I said, I'm not going to live like this. I'm going to kill myself. But God has to show me the joy in losing it all. Because in losing it, I begin to have a right relationship with him. And then, when those things begin to come back, they weren't as important as they were before. I could care less. It didn't matter, because I had the joy of the Lord. Amen? Amen? But let's look at some people who did this, because even in laughter in the heart, there is sorrow because cares, riches, and pleasures rob people of the possibility of fruitful living. Cares, amen, riches, and pleasures rob people of a possibility of fruitful living. So let's look at a parable that Jesus did. Let's go to Luke 8. Actually, there's a synoptic version of this, but I chose Luke because Luke is more detailed in his explanation of this. Amen. Luke chapter 8. And if you ever heard it called the parable of the sea sower, most of us talk about it, but we don't really examine it. So let's look at it a little bit closely. A little bit more closely. All right? And we're going to look at Luke 8, starting at verse 4. Now, this is when Jesus was, you know, talking, and, and this is when the Pharisees and religious folk came to try to challenge him. But he let them know it, and Jesus had a way of living. You know, I never understood about the Pharisees and Sadducees. They had the Word standing, because the Bible says he is the Word, and the Word became flesh, and walked among us, right? How are you going to challenge the Bible? The living Bible. God himself standing there, and they want to challenge him with the law. You want to ask the Bible, the Bible. <laughs> You're telling me wrong. I don't get it. That just blows my heart. But anyway, starting at verse 4. And when much people were gathered together and were coming to him out of every city, he spake this parable. He spake by parable. Because he never gave the religious folk a straight answer. Because they were knowing. He always spoke to them in parable. But he decided he would explain it to them in detail later. If you ever read a parable or a story in the Bible and don't think you understand it, just keep reading it. Jesus always explains himself Amen. to his children. He only left the mystery to those who are unsaid. Amen. If you want God, you will keep going on. Amen? Amen. 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 Verse 5. Now, here's the parable. And a sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell by the wayside. And it was trotted down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell on rock. And as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. Verse 7. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. Mm -hmm. And others fell on good ground and sprang up and bare fruit a hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried. I 
I never saw that before. When he said these things, he cried. And he, he that has ears to hear, let him hear. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. Now watch this in verse 9. What does it say there? And his disciples asked him, saying, what might this parable be? See that? They said, explain it to me. Now he's giving me an explanation. Ain't that a perfect example that I just said to y'all? He always explains the parable. Now here's the explanation of what he was saying. Because he was talking to those who were religious, those who were legalistic, those who were selfish. Those only had cares for this world. Amen. <laughs> they didn't care about him. Talking about they were looking for the Messiah, when the Messiah was standing there, they couldn't even recognize him. Amen. So, verse 10. And he said, this is what it is, verse 10. And he said, unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. See? Unto you is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. But to others in power. Uh-huh. That seeing they might not see. And hearing, they might not understand. Now, the parable is this. The seed is the what? Word of God. Come on. Those by the wayside are they that what? Hear. Then cometh the who? Devil. And take them away the word out of their heart. See, that's why I know every time a preacher preaches to you and you receive it with joy, it means. It didn't say, wait, yesterday. It didn't say, there's another word that said, will come to take it from you. Amen. You know, wait. Hey, wait. He's sitting next to you, some of you. But he come to church. Hello. Amen. He come to hear the word too. Amen. Angels come too. Did y'all know that? Amen. You know how many angels are probably in this room right now because they can't understand this thing called redemption that you get and God didn't give to them. Amen. So they follow us around to understand redemption. Amen. How in the world can you get redeemed? If I make one mistake, God sends me to hell. But with you, all you got to do is say, forgive me, Lord. And he lets you go. Angels never yeah. understand that. So they follow you around and say, what's this gospel called redemption? Amen. We don't get it. But you do. Amen. Amen. Let's keep going. That was a little side sidetrack there. Verse 12. Um, Those by the wayside are they that hear, then come up the dust, and take away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be what? Saved. Keep going. Verse 13. They on the rock are they which, when they hear, receive the word of what? Joy. And that's what we're talking about. And these have no root, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation, do what? Fall away. away. Soon as something else come up, you don't want it. You're running away. Because, see, I'm laughing because I had to live this thing. See, this is telling you that when God is telling you to change your life, you don't want it. See? Every time he tells you it's time to change your life, you don't want it. So you fall away. You believed it. You received it with joy. Y'all come in here every day, every day, day after day, and receive the word with joy. Plenty of teachers come to here. You receive it with joy. Then you go right back out there and live the same way. Did you really receive it with joy? Because when the time of testing or temptation come, you can't help it. I want to go back to the way I was living. I enjoyed that more. I'd rather wake up with a hangover. I'd rather wake up in the gutter. I don't see people who come to this place and leave after they received it with joy. Then my question is this, because I can't judge your heart. Were you really here for that purpose? Or did you have an ulterior motive? But God is not going to be mocked. I've also seen them come through here and die. Amen. 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 Let's keep going on. See, I don't want none of you to quit, man. <coughs> when you receive this word with joy, don't quit. Because now the devil is turning up the fire because he knows you receive it with joy. He hates anybody with joy. <laughs> he wants to put you through this thing. He wants to cause you to quit. Don't quit. Still keep dancing with joy that you got this thing. Amen. Verse 14. And that which fell among thorns are they which... When they heard, have heard, go forth and are choked with what? Cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to maturity. That word perfection is maturity. So now you got it. You've got to enjoy it. Now God is blessing you. Amen. He's giving you all these things, restoring you. And I see that happen here. People get jobs. They forget who helped them. I know when I first came through here and I got a job, the first thing I did was give money to this ministry. Amen. Amen. <laughs> and I still give money to this ministry. 
You know why? Because this was the house that fed me. Amen. And I'm not just talking about with food. They spiritually fed me too. You shouldn't be giving money no place unless they're feeding you spiritually <laughs> and naturally. Amen. Why do you think pastors always say, well, why are you sending my money over there to sell Joe, Joe Lowe's church and you're getting fed here? Amen. Amen. Then if you want to get fed at Joe Blow's church, that's where you should be getting fed. So if you, wherever you sow your money, it should be at the place you're getting fed. Amen. Amen. Because Amen. Amen. this house does not push giving to you. They believe in giving you more. This is a Presbyterian house. And I've never seen people give so much in all my life. I'm used to hearing people being condemned for not giving. You know what I mean? Don't condemn me if I don't give. You know what I mean? Because God said, I want to have a cheerful giver. I'd rather have a chance for giving, but I don't sit up here and say, well, the Lord told me time, you don't give, you're going to be cursed. I'm not going to tell you that. Matter of fact, I never believed that. You know, especially when I became homeless. You ain't going to make me feel guilty, and I still saw God moving in my life. And I didn't give him a dime. But he still fed me, covered me, and gave to me. And I didn't give a tithe, an offering, or nothing. But he was showing me, you do those things out of your heart for your love for me. Amen. You want to give to me because you love me. Because outside of that, I don't want it. I'll keep giving to you. Amen. That was a sidetrack again. Lord, what are you doing? <laughs> Amen. Amen. Let's keep reading verse 15. Now, but that on the good ground are they which in an honest seat and good heart, having heard the word, they obeyed. The word keeping means they obeyed it. And bring forth what? Fruit with what? Patience. So if you're going to do anything for the Lord, do it out of obedience and do it because you love him. And when you're doing that, you're going to get joy for doing it. Amen? You're going to have a joyful heart. So, as we saw, the cares and riches of this world is usually the things that drag you back out there. Start loving Jesus. Start getting the joy in Jesus. Stop worrying about your condition right now. He got you in this particular place so that he can mature you so that you can help someone else. And if you stop complaining, because God hates more men complaining. I mean, that, that's the nastiness to it. Amen? Let him mature you and work this thing out. And don't be in such a hurry. Believe me. Believe me. It took me 15 years to get where I'm at today, and I'm still growing. I'm not stopping. I'm still growing. Each time I think I reach the plateau, God lets me know, no, now you're going to have to fight this kind of battle. Then I get enough. No. Now you're in the fight. I'll be thinking it's over. It ain't over until you bring me home. Amen. Might as well get used to it. It ain't going to be over until you go home to be with the Lord, all right? All right, let's look at this one now. What is peace of God? Good, we got about 20 more minutes. What is peace of God? A sense of well-being and fulfillment that comes from God and is dependent on his presence. You only get peace when you are depending on God and his presence. Do anybody know or ever felt the presence of God in life? Amen. You just know it's, it's just abnormal. And sometimes you can't even explain it. It's just so, ooh, because you never, ooh, the peace of God is awesome, isn't it? For those of you who know and felt what it is. Amen. Such peace is a fruit of the spirit that forms part of the whole armor of God. But that's a part of the armor of God. Enabling Christians to withstand the attacks of the forces of evil. So, did you know peace was a weapon? I don't know if some of you have been here when I told on special ops, obey, pray, submit, but I showed you that one of those weapons was the peace of God. If you have no peace in you, you constantly fight it. And you, most of the time, you fight fighting yourself. That's where the, no peace comes from. You blame the people and the family members and the, the co-workers and friends <laughs> for bringing that disruption in your life, but it's actually you fighting it. Because you don't have to accept nothing they say or do. Only, only accept the correction of God. Amen. Now, God does use men and women of God to tell you and warn you, call prophets to say, stop doing what you're doing. And if there is a discomfort in there, every time I get discomforted, I always go to God and say, what am I doing wrong, Lord? Because I know it's something wrong. You know? Even when I have an argument with, with, with family members, can everybody, you know, your loved ones, hey, we fight. But then I look in the mirror and say, what was it about me? Forget them. What was it about me, God, that caused this situation? Amen. I could be right up, down, forward, and back. But I still want to know, why did this person I love have this problem with me? What is it about me? What could I have done different to <coughs> love them and cause the situation to change? 
Despite them being wrong, they could be wrong all day. But I need to know what was it about me that caused this? How could I have loved them to prevent this? Amen. Maybe that's just me, but I need to know. God, show me. Because I want to be more like you. No matter who I'm around. And I want people to see you in me. Amen. 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 So let's look at the peace of God. Let's go to uh, Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Because the word tells us God is the God of what? Peace. So let's look at Philippians 4. Because so God is the God of peace. Now next week we're going to be looking at long suffering, but this is I'm already studying it and it beat me. <laughs> Woo! Can't wait to bring that one. Mm. I can't wait to bring that one. So, uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 through 9. 8 and 9. Philippians 4, 8 and 9 says, Finally, brother, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are good report, if there be any virtue, and that word virtue is power, and if there be any praise, think. Give me the word think again. What I said was, it gets them out. Calculate. Think on these things. Calculate them. Now, it's something you can't calculate. Calculate them. Calculate on these things. Take an inventory of your goodness. Amen. Amen. Of your honesty. Amen. Of your pureness. Now, you can calculate, but don't calculate evil. Why would you want to calculate evil when you can calculate good? Amen? Because those are the rewards you're going to give heaven. God's going to let you say, you didn't do X, Y, Z. Matter of fact, let's open the books to see if your name is in there. Is Joe Blow name in here? Okay. Oh, Joe Blow did this, Joe Blow did that. Oh, wow, Joe Blow, well done, that good and faithful servant. Enter into thy rest. But if you look up here and say, Joe Blow did this and Joe Blow did that, but Joe Blow's motive was evil. Mm -hmm. Depart from me, I never knew you. But Lord, I did! Feed the home. Depart from me, I never knew you. But Lord, I did! Depart from me, I never knew you. But Lord, I did not. No, depart from me, I never knew you. Because I know the intent of your heart, there was no love in it. Amen. Amen. There was no joy in it. Amen. And you didn't cause no peace. Because hmm. you calculated it. Amen. Amen. Boy, I can hear a pen dropping here. Amen. Oh, hey, believe me, beat up the speaker first. All right, the gospel is the good news. Of peace. Let's look at that. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. So we know God is the God of peace, right? Oh, wait a minute. Before we go, we need to read verse 9. I'm sorry. Go back to Philippians 4, verse 9. Those things which you have heard, both learned and received, and heard, and seen in me, and seen in me, rather, do. For the God of what? Peace shall be with you. Amen. I need you to see that he was the God of peace. I'm just moving a little quickly. Uh, so. All right, now we're going to look at the gospel is the good news of peace. So let's go to Ephesians, the book right behind it. Ephesians chapter 6. And I look at verse 15. Now, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 15. And your feet shroud with the preparation of the what? Gospel of peace. Now, that whole thing from verses 13 on down, is actually, actually the uh, armors of God. Amen? Matter of fact, let's take a look at it. Let's go up to verse 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of what? God. That you may be able to withstand in the what? Evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. Now, that's the Bible. Having your loins girt about with truth is the Bible. They call it the belt of truth. It's the word gymnastics. Or the logos, the written <laughs> word. Amen? So most people will call the sword of the spirit the Bible. Take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. That's not the Bible. I'm approving it. Amen? Here we go. Verse 15 again. No, go back to 14. Stay there for a happy little voice, girl, about the truth. And have you on the what? Breastplate of righteousness. And your feet travel with the what? Preparation of the gospel of peace. Verse 16. And above all, take the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. In, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. See that? Now, that word of God there is called the rhema word. It's the Greek word rhema. And it means give him a specific word. And where does that specific word come from, people? Your mouth. But if you haven't been in the word of truth, you can't have nothing inside of you to bring it out, can you? How can I tell you something about? Jesus is Lord. Amen. Amen. Now it's coming out. 
When the devil and Jesus were fighting in the wilderness for temptation for 40 days and 40 nights, he didn't have a Bible. The devil came to him with the word. He said, jump off this mountain. Jesus said, man, man, do not tempt the Lord thy God. He said, let's not uh, dash that foot against the stone. He's coming out of Psalms 91, the devil. Amen. Amen. And Jesus said, don't tempt the Lord thy God. And he said, turn thy, turn this rocks into bread. Jesus came right back and do the Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that you see about the mouth of God. See, they were having a sword fight. They were cutting one another. Amen. Learn how to cut the enemy with a specific word. Because everywhere you go, you ain't going to have a Bible, people. But it should be in you. That's all I'm trying to say. Amen. All right. God has made this peace a reality in Jesus Christ, who is our peace. Let's go to Philippians 4 again. Go back to Philippians 4 again. Because Jesus is our peace, right? Jesus is our peace. I hope this is not too heavy for some of you. Because I've been asking God, God, am I bringing it too deep? Because you know what? Those of you who are born again, it ain't going to be no mystery to you. What I'm saying, hopefully you will put it into action. Because without love, you can do nothing. Amen. So if you're hating someone and not forgiving someone today, you need to move into love. So God can change the circumstance in your life. Amen? Amen. Philippians 4, look at verses 6 and 7 now. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by what? Prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Verse 7, and the peace of God, see? And the peace of God will pass as what? All understanding. So keep your hearts and minds through who? Christ Jesus. The peace that surpasses all understanding. You'll have such a peace you can't understand it. Amen. I'm serious. Well, what? It's amazing to me. All right. Now, another thing we're going to look at here. In Jesus, we discover the ultimate peace which only God can give. Go to John 14. In Jesus, we discover, we discover the ultimate peace which only God can give. John 14. We get ready to come to the close. One more little story, and we'll be done. John 14. And looking at verse 27, 14, 27, it says what? Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives, I give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. But peace I give unto you. Amen. Now, I want to show you how Jesus used that peace as a weapon. And maybe you will too. Are y'all ready to see how Jesus used peace as a weapon? That's cool. And how this peace that surpasses all understanding, you can start putting it in your life. Now, I'm getting chills just thinking about it the way I was studying this thing. I'm telling you, those who want it, grab it. So let's go um, to Mark chapter 4. We're going to look at Jesus gave us an example on how to get peace during the storm. So we want to show you how you can get peace during the storm. I'm excited about this because I'm putting it into practice. Amen? So let's go to Mark 4. Then we're going to come to a close after this. Amen. Mark chapter 4. It might be a familiar story, but God was showing me some things. And he even took me back to when my bishop, uh, Jimmy Ellis, back in Philadelphia, had taught this. And I didn't get it back then. But when I restudied it, I got it now. Amen? Yeah. Amen. I ain't dead yet. <laughs> as long as I can keep on learning, we won't ever be learning. All right. So we're going to look at Mark chapter 4, starting at verse 35. Ready? And the same day, when the eve was come, he said unto them, let us pass over unto the other side. Now he had just got finished preaching. You know, there was thousands of people. And he got a word from God to just say, let us go to the other side. Amen? Verse 36. And when they had sent away the multitude, see, they told everybody to go away. When they sent away the multitude, they took him, even as he was in a ship, and there were also with them other little ships. That was the thing God wrote the word out to my attention. Please pay attention to the other little ships. Bring something out about the other 